This machine will have eyes, ears, and a voice. This is PVP Television News. Thank you very much. Well, the first thing I want to do, like everyone else, is to um, say thanks for an invitation to come and speak to you. I can, al I can also say that I'm, I've got an advantage over, over my, Michael Breeze Davis because I do have a predetermined view and I'm very keen to express it. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think that onshore wind, and I thought this for quite a long time, is the biggest scam that I've seen in my career in public life, which is probably now 30 or 40 years. In, uh, in 20 years' time, we'll be looking back and wondering how on earth did we allow energy giants driven by subsidy and profit to con the government of the day into giving them just so much money to deliver uh, energy which they won't do at a cost we can't afford, and it'll be, they'll be just complete white elephants. A lot of the wind turbines will be knocked down or come to the end of their first term of life. The big lumps of concrete will still be in the ground. The communities will still be split where they came. They will cause a mega amount of damage, and the politicians who are allowing it today, I think, will they will be gone. But I just hope we remember those that are still alive, and we point a finger at them, and we tell them, you did that. And that's something I think we all have to do. Now, then, all I can put into this is because John Constable is right. Now, I contact John from time to time because I need to have information, and he has that information. And he had really good support. But in the end, this is going to be one, and you're quite right, John, this will be one in the political world. It'll be one in the gutters of politics. Now, I'm quite lucky I've been there a while, and I've started to learn how it works. And you just, there's no other way you win this other than fighting, and fighting pretty dirty. Now, I sometimes get into discussions when people think I'm almost unreasonable. And you can't be reasonable. You can't say on the one hand this and on the one hand that. What you've got to do is say, this is terrible, we've got to stop it, and you go 100% and do your best to do it. And we are having some success. There's been a transformation in the last two years. We've taken a few small, small steps to where we want to be, but we've still got a pretty long way to go. Now what I want to just, just do in a, a brief few comments I'm going to make is put the political context of where we are. Now John's done a bit of that, and I want to put perhaps a little bit more on top of it. As a little bit of the history, and I realized what we were facing, because I was doing, uh, in 2005, I was doing what Russell George is doing now. I was the environment spokesman in this. So I was looking at this issue when it was first proposed, that we were going to cover mid Wales in wind farms and pretty well destroy it. And I guess I started to understand what it meant. And then I became a total opponent of onshore wind. That this, and you spend some time looking at it, and you know it's a huge con. And that's the way it's going. But it was very difficult for the people of the area to understand what was going to happen until we saw the proposal, which was probably about two years ago. Now, I knew there had to be the associated infrastructure. I knew the damage that that would cause. I was the president of the campaign for the protection of rural Wales, and we were horrified by what we knew was coming. But when we saw what was coming, the people of this area realised that we cared too much about this place to allow it to go down without a fight. And there are people who are fighting hugely there, groups who are doing a lot of very careful where they're preparing a legal case, and we are protesting like probably we've never seen a protest before. And it's developing networks across the country, and it's building more and more. And what we've done through doing that, now I don't get involved in the detail, I don't get involved in the impacts, the noise, and everything else. These groups are doing a really good job on that. All I try and do is to make sure that my colleagues in the House of Commons understand the political price they will pay if they won't listen to these people. And they've started listening to these people. Now, about, probably about, it must be probably 12 months ago now, about 100, 106 MPs wrote to the Telegraph expressing their opposition to onshore wind. Now, I wasn't one of those. I wrote a private letter because I was a PPS. I'd have to have resigned if I'd signed that letter. But I wrote a private letter to the Chancellor at the same time. The two Liberal Democrats in Midwales know perfectly well that unless they joined us, their careers would be finished. So they signed the letter. I think they had some fairly, they had quite a few meetings without coffee with the leadership of the Lib Dems after signing it. But they did sign that letter. It just shows you how people are realizing that this is a hugely political issue with consequences. And what happened then is that the 
Prime Minister realised what was going to happen. What had been going on is that every time John, George Osborne saw me, when there was all the debate about uh, rocks values, he used to run away and he put his hands up like this, say, oh, not again, because there were a number of us who were chasing him around. And I was working with Chris Heaton Harris, who was a member of Parliament for Daventry, who was a very, very able man and very committed to this cause. And we, had, we knew we got George Osborne on our side. Now what happened is that John Hayes was appointed, which is a very important step. But the most important aspect of that was that the, he was, is that the Prime Minister appointed him. And the Prime Minister appointed him because he knew exactly what John Hayes would say. In fact, I suspect that in actual fact, when John Hayes made his remarks, it was, it was designed as an opportunity for the Prime Minister to make the comment that there having to be a debate in Prime Minister's question, and I think that was planned. I, and, it was, and it was a hugely important statement. Because where we are now is that the government knows that we have to find a way of getting ourselves out of this issue. But it can't be, you, you've got to be very careful because we're in a coalition. And for some reason, and it beats me, the Liberal Democrats think this is something they can be proud of and trumpet. We've had an announcement today where the government has decided to spend a huge amount, billions more, on subsidizing these energy giants that, that are destroying, driving people into fuel into, into poverty. They're driving, I mean, Tata Steel, 700, or 900 jobs went today. We're gonna to see huge numbers of jobs from Britain disappearing because of the cost of energy. We've got consumer focus today complaining bitterly because the extra bills are gonna go on the poorest. There's six million people in Britain in fuel poverty, and we are piling more and more bills on them. It's bonkers. Now, the Liberal Democrats are thinking that's a triumph and a huge success. Well, the best of luck to them. Because I think the people of Britain won't forget those sort of, that sort of talk we're seeing. Where are we going to go now, I think, is the Treasury are playing for time. We know that next year, the year after, we'll be developing manifestos for the 2015 elections. My ambition is that the Conservative manifesto, and I think it's not, it's not just an, an ambition, I think it's a realistic ambition, that the Conservative manifesto will recognise that onshore wind is the scam it is, that we can't allow these huge energy, energy companies, mostly overseas, to carry on, on conning us out of huge amounts of money, causing so much damage to our country, that I think our policy will be very significantly changed, and we might see the scourge of onshore wind going into reverse. And that's the ambition. I think we've got a fair chance of succeeding. Thank you. Have we any questions for Lynn? Robert Jenkins. First of all, I, I think we need a few extra wind turbines to heat this uh, hall up a bit. <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> It's a bit cold in here, but never mind. <laughs> anyway, um, it's something which I feel was a success in Cardiff when we all went down to protest in, uh, in front of the Welsh Assembly. I thought it was a very successful day, but I'd like to know what everybody's opinion on the panel is about us all going to London before the inquiry. I, I'm willing to go, even if it's in the middle of Lamin, I'd be willing to go. Because I, I can't understand how nobody's come up with the idea. And, uh, you know, Trap should be coming up with this idea and all the other organisations. We should be getting down to London. Like, you know, I, I, I know perhaps a lot of you are against hunting, but, you know, it, it, did, it did get them success, in a way. But I think we should all go down, you know, in our thousands. And from the Ken Cork area, all the way down the Vernery Valley, in Abermule as well, I know they've, they've got, got off with it, but they should come and support us now as well. And everybody work together. Thank you. Um, I thought the, um, the protest meeting in Cardiff was a, a massive success. And I think it was a response to, I became a bit carried away at a public meeting in Welshpool in the livestock market. Whenever I'm in front of thousands of people and they're all cheering and I've got a microphone, I sometimes get a little bit overexcited. And towards the end of that meeting, I just challenged everybody to come to Cardiff. And everybody did. And it was a massive success. 
And a lot of people after that, because they did change the First Minister's mind, he's mind you, he's changed it back again, but he did, he did actually change his mind. But as soon as the energy companies saw him, he fell over like a pedal duster. And the man is completely unreliable. But a lot of people have asked me exactly the same as you have. And Westminster doesn't work like that. I mean, you'd have to have, I mean, last, an example this week, we had tens and thousands, I mean, probably 100,000 people marching. It didn't have the slightest impact on the House of Commons at all. And there's a number, there's one or two problems. It was always picking a time, and we would, we would, very, we would never get the numbers to London. You'd need to get probably at least 100,000 people to have any sort of significant impact that you sort of had in Cardiff. And I just don't think one can do that. But what you can do, and this is very much something that I've had in mind, worked with Chris Eaton Harris and had in mind, but it's difficult to do, is to have a date when there's a significant debate in the House of Commons and have people from every part of the country come down and accost MPs in the in central lobby. When you can have some effect, I've seen one or two of those protests work. But the great difficulty we have, and it's the House of Commons isn't quite like the Assembly. Our business is very often decided in the morning. Uh, you just can't plan anything. Because, I mean, I, tried to, I, I used to prepare speeches and I stand up to speak, assuming I got 10 minutes, and suddenly I had two. It's, it's all very short term, so it's very, very difficult to plan. There is a group of us in the House of Commons now who are looking at issues like this and looking for every opportunity we can have to make life difficult for the government. We've got an energy bill coming. I don't know how it'll be. I don't know what amendments there'll be to that. There may be chances to do that. But the, the way to do this is, is to pressurise MPs all over the country to, to see and to understand how much opposition there is. And it's in their own areas. There's, a hundred, there's over 100 Conservatives, you know, backbenchers, and you've got front benches. Uh, I mean, Owen Patterson's a friend. I was with Owen Patterson this afternoon. I mean, uh, I can't say exactly what, in case there's a journalist here who might spill the beans, but I can just say that Owen's views are very much in accordance with mine. He's a senior cabinet member now. He's not responsible for energy, but he's a serious cabinet member, and in the picking order, he's quite high. John Hayes, there's not the slightest doubt in my mind, but that John Hayes has the ear of the Prime Minister. I mean, normally what he did, he should have been sacked for. If any minister who's the second in charge says that sort of, normally it's the end of their career. And when I was the, a PPS, what I did in Cardiff, I should have been sacked. I thought I would be, actually, because they were so outrageous. But I wasn't. And that's because their support for what I was saying in the cabinet. If you sack somebody who's saying what everybody thinks, everybody supports, all that happens is the government itself loses support because you're, you've got your position because you know you've got the people behind you. And that's where we are. I think we're making huge strides in this battle where it's eventually going to be won. We haven't got the successes we want yet to, 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 for that tipping point to be reached. But we're, we're well on the way and I think if we keep at it and carry on pressurising it. But what I don't think is that, 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 that the last thing we want is a demonstration in London that doesn't work. And I don't think it will work. I mean, that's why I'm not keen on it. I just don't think it will work. I come from Shropshire, CPRE. My name is Sylvie Martin. We are fully aware of the threat of pylons through Shropshire, as indeed Owen Patterson is. And um, we uh, support the efforts of groups in Montgomeryshire to put a stop to these wind farms. However, my question is this. You're probably aware, Mr. Davis, that um, Mr. Alex Salmond is driving wind farms across the whole of Scotland. In five years, there have been 5,500 applications yeah. for wind farms, and about 80% of those are going through. It is destroying the landscape of Scotland, and I deplore it because I happen to have spent my childhood there. But my question is this. If those wind farms are built in Scotland, is there going to be any need for wind farms in England or Wales? Well, uh, that's, that, that's, uh, I got a huge amount of sympathy. I think Alex Salmon, I, I think this is probably the policy that will probably see the back of Alex Salmon in the end. Good. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a huge, it's a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake in, in Scotland. Actually, you might be interested to know that I'm a, I work quite closely with the John Muir Trust, which is 
very much a Scottish-based organisation. In fact, I'm presenting a petition to Parliament in defence of the wild spaces of Britain, predominantly Scotland, I think, in the next, sometime in, in the next couple of weeks. I mean, they're a wonderful organisation. The, 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 the opposition to having the wild places of Scotland destroyed by a government that uh, is driving a policy that increasingly people will come to oppose. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great organisation to be involved with. And I, but, I, but, but the, the issue, question you ask is whether it, it can obviously be transported to, to here. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a company in Ireland that called, called Green Wire who are, who are talking about also building wind farms in Ireland and passing them over to, uh, you know, and thinking that the British government, they look so after they're going to subsidise this wind farm, they might even subsidise them. But I don't think that that will happen. But I mean, in, my, in, in my view, it doesn't matter whether it's Scotland or or, or in, in Wales or England or Ireland, they don't work. They don't deliver. They don't. They don't. It's not what it says on the tin. They're no good, and we're starting to find out they're no good. And George Osborne, in particular, knows that the British economy is in the most monstrous debt, and he's going to have to find a way of, of not. Going. If, he, if, if we weren't in coalition at the moment with the Liberal Democrats, I could bet you that this policy would be changed. I feel pretty confident. And when we're developing separate policies for the next manifesto, I think the, the views will change a lot. The difficulty we got at the moment, we don't know that, I mean, this is straightforward politics. We know that the Liberal Democrats have, have been hit pretty hard. Their, their polling is very, very poor. Their coalition partners, I work absolutely with them, I see myself in partnership. You have a, an announcement like yesterday, or today's, it's sold as a great success for the Liberal Democrats. Whether it is, is neither here nor there. It's sold as a success because both parties in the coalition want to bolster the Lib Dems because if we don't want the coalition to fall apart, otherwise the, the, the government falls apart. So you, you've always got to pick things at face value. They don't work if Alex Salmon drives, the more he drives them, the more he drives nails into his own political coffin. And that is, that I think is the reality. Um, Glyn, we're facing the public inquiries next June. Um, I'd like your views on how we should get together and fight this. My view is quite simply, if we try and fight it individually, we're going to lose. We've got to do what we've done all along, stay absolutely united, uh, trap, stop, uh, map, all these wonderful groups, but they've all fought under the one banner stop the wind farms and you stop everything else. So I think this is a critical moment and I, I'd like your views as how we can all come together and fight as one body instead of individuals. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I need to give any advice to it because, because you know on it too well. I mean, I, I think there's a, a magnificent team effort here. All the groups are working together magnificently. What, what, what we, Unfortunately, we're going to have to, they're going to have to raise an awful lot of money. Powers County Council have set aside 2.8 million, I think. It's an amazing amount of money. I mean, from a poorly funded council to sort of take on these wind farms that are being given billions of pounds by the government. It makes it a very difficult, but I mean, it's, it's a huge commitment by the County Council to do that. But there's a lot of money being raised to develop legal opinion. I think Neville Thomas is doing a good job, there's other people doing a good job. It'll have to be fought the best they can through the legal system, and that's, I mean, all I can say is, I can see what you're calling for, Richard, but from my observation, I see all that happening. There's a lot of technical, legal, various arguments. I, I don't get involved in them because I can see other people are doing that. I've spoken tonight as a straightforward kind of a, a gutter politician, because that's where this is going to be argued and that's where it's going to be won, and I'm the only person in a position in Montgomeryshire, who can who can enter into that contest? So that's what I try to focus on completely, and not getting involved. But the other stuff is being done. It's a, it's a fantastic team effort, and all I can say is carry on doing it. Dave Tremellan, Stop Bridge North Wind Farm campaign. There are a lot of people wondering what we can do. There are a lot of disparate groups around the country, all fighting for the same thing, but nobody ever seems to talk to each other. There's one person here, actually, who's trying to do something about it. His name's Henry Carpenter. When this meeting's finished, talk to Henry. 
Okay, he'll give you one of his contact cards. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. Um, it, it, we do need to have contacts right across Britain. And an organisation was set up. It was called Now. It, I, 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 you know, it was, and it, the principle was terrific. And I don't know how well that's going, how much of an impact it's, it, it's having. But the principle, the structure, is there. And that's a very good example of why London doesn't work. Why London doesn't work. Because to launch Now, it was... It was going to be launched in the House of Commons, and it, but it was, and there was a, and, and all that happened is that the, I think we dropped to a one-line web about a few hours before it was actually done. Everybody, everybody disappeared, and there was almost nobody left in the House of Commons at all. So, the, so you timed the launch on a very important day, and it was a complete, it was, it was a very poor launch because there was nobody there. I mean, that's the difficulty of working in the House of Commons. But there is an organisation in place, and it's called, and, um, I don't know, something. N O W. I'm not quite sure. I guess the W is for wind farms, but I'm not sure what the N and the O is for. National opposition to wind farms. National opposition to wind farms. There we are. We we got one enthusiastic member there. I'm a member, and it holds conferences and everything else. But I mean, uh, you know, I mean, these links are very good. It's, it's, it's now happening in the House of Commons. There's, a, there's, a, there's at least a hundred backbench Conservative MPs, some in other parties, who are just working together and doing everything we can. And it's very unusual. I, all, I mean. I'm openly arguing with government policy. I'm opposing the coalition government's policy publicly. I was doing it when I was at PBS. There are other PBS is doing it. It's an incredibly unusual position. Maybe that's what coalition politics is like. But there's a huge number and a growing number of people who are doing everything they can to condemn this. And when they do that, the Prime Minister of the day has to respond. And I, I think he is responding. And the biggest response he's done so far was to appoint John Hayes. Machine will have eyes, ears, and a voice.